uh, not to worry, we're going to be recording the presenters, not anyone else. So if during the questions, um, you do want to pop on video, if you don't want yourself to be recorded, just let us know, or you can always pop your questions in the chat and we'll be happy to ask them of our presenters. So a couple workarounds if you don't want to get yourself captured in that video. The advantage of that, of course, is as I mentioned a few seconds ago, if you have to step away and you don't catch the end of the presentation, it will be up on Future Energy Systems YouTube and you can check out all the other great talks we've done. Um, it's a really great way to sort of get an idea of what kind of presentations we've been doing and what research is happening over with Future Energy Systems. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Valerie Miller from Future Energy Systems to do a land acknowledgement and introduce our speakers this evening. Thank you so much, Cassidy. Welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you here. Today is a, a special, well, a special week. It is Energy Week for Future Energy Systems. It's also Science Literacy Week, so a great week to come and learn more about energy. And the theme actually this year for Science Literacy Week is climate. Uh, so let's jump right in. We want to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others who his whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. We are truly grateful to have the opportunity to work, study, and live on this land. Uh, and as you see in the chat, we would love to hear where you are joining us from. One of our speakers is joining us from Ottawa tonight. So uh, thank you for staying up extra late with us. To give you a bit of background for anyone who doesn't know what Future Energy Systems is, Future Energy Systems was launched in 2016 with a $75 million grant from the Government of Canada's Canada First Research Excellence Fund to help Canada transition to a low net carbon energy economy. We focus on multidisciplinary research that develops the energy technologies of the near future, integrates them into today's infrastructure, and examines possible consequences for our society, economy, and environment. We also contribute to the development of solutions for challenges presented by the current energy system. We have over 110 research projects, over 850 graduate students, postdocs, and other highly qualified personnel, and over 150 researchers. And we are so lucky tonight to have three of them here with us to explore their research. We do wish to remind current and future viewers that the opinions expressed by the speaker are not necessarily those of the Edmonton Public Library, Future Energy Systems, or the University of Alberta. Now, I would love to invite Steve up on screen to share your presentation. Uh, everyone, this is Dr. Steve Bergens, and I am going to pass it over to you to share your amazing research. Okay, just give me one second to figure out how to share my amazing research. Yeah. I hacked yeah. it a second ago. We did, it's we did a full away. tech. We got We this. did a full check, tech test and it worked, here we go. Perfect. That we was can see your slides, yes. Okay, fantastic. All right, so first of all, thanks so much, Valerie, for the introduction. Thanks to the Edmonton Public Library for letting us come and speak today. Uh, thanks to Future Energy Systems. It has been an astonishing event and, and um, feature of the university to be able to work with so many amazing people on energy and how we're gonna try to solve the crisis that we currently face. And it's also humbling to be able to contribute so today I'm gonna to talk about catalysis. I'm gonna bring some introductory stuff to catalysis of catalysis for folks. I'm gonna talk about climate change and then I'm gonna focus on our research in solar fuels. I'm very happy to have two of my current and former students with us tonight. The first one is Octavio Perez. He is a senior graduate student. He originally came from Mexico He's approaching the end of his studies and uh, I can't wait for him to tell you about one of the projects he's working on. And the other person is Michael Donahoe. He is, uh, he is an undergraduate student from University of 
Ottawa. He joined us only for a summer as part of the Inorganic Chemistry Exchange Program, uh, where inorganic labs from all over the country exchange undergraduate students for the summer to exchange ideas, to give folks opportunities to do research in other labs, different parts of the country. Mike came to us for three months. He had to spend the first part of it in quarantine when he arrived. We're all doing the best we can with COVID. Stay safe, folks. But um, he discovered quite a big breakthrough and it worked out quite well. And uh, we're in the process of finishing up that work and publishing it. And he'll tell you a little bit about it tonight. So uh, very happy to have him with us tonight. And he's joining us from Ottawa, as I said. So without further ado, let's get on with the topic of the talk. Valerie, please remind me at the half hour mark or so in case we want to take a break for questions at that point. Absolutely well. Talk. Thank you. So let's talk about catalysis, climate change and solar fuels. I'll talk about catalysis first. So what is catalysis? Let me close one of these windows here because, well, looks like I can't do that. Oh, well. So a catalyst is nature's way of recycling molecules on the molecular level. It is probably the most efficient way to do a reaction. And so what happens now, there is some chemistry. Okay, if you invite a chemist, you're gonna get some chemistry on the screen, but I'm gonna chop all of it out, only take it down to what you really need to know. There's gonna be no exam, there's gonna be no equilibrium problem questions afterwards. So you'll be all right, I promise. But what a catalyst does is it's a molecule, could be a solid, could be an enzyme, could be a metal, could be a specific uh, custom molecule. It grabs a molecule of reactant, it enters the catalytic cycle, it produces the product, so it pushes out the product, and it gets regenerated at the end of the reaction. Because it's regenerated at the end of the reaction, it can go right back into the beginning and do it over again. So catalytic cycles, they consist of many steps, but the fundamental process here is the catalyst is reused on a molecular level. And so really good catalytic reactions. I've seen academic stuff at the ratio of 2 million molecules of, a, of, of reactant for one, million, uh, for one molecule of catalyst. So a 2 million to one ratio, and it all gets turned into the product and the catalyst is ready for more. Of course, we didn't invent catalysis. Nature is a much better scientist than we are. Catalysis has been around since probably the beginning of the planet, and there are enzymes, biological systems that can do turnovers that we can't even imagine. Where a turnover is once around the cycle from reactant to product and then regenerating the catalyst. But it's recycling on the molecular level. And that's the most important point of this slide. It is the most efficient way to do chemistry. And when you think about it, it it's one of the few intersections between green chemistry and uh, chemistry uh, for, for industry. And, and by that, I mean, the ideal chemical reaction is this one, where you only have reactant, nothing else, and it only makes product, no other side products, no solvents, nothing in the amount of product that you need as you need it in 100% yield. All chemical wastes out there are waste products, side products, okay? People don't throw away the product. So if you can get a reaction that does this, it's called atom economy, where all of the atoms go into the product and nothing else. You have no waste. You have the perfect chemical reaction. And this is the one point where environmentalists and economists are in complete agreement. If you make no waste, you have no waste. Okay? And catalysis, of course, there's very few reactions like this, but catalysis comes closest to this ideal. And that's why it's so powerful. Okay. So like I said, we didn't invent catalysis. It's been a biology and nature discovered it a long time ago. Uh, there's probably catalysis going on on the surface of uh, meteorites floating around in space, uh, ultraviolet chemistry and that sort of things. But uh, 
it, it's such a good process that you know there's no way it didn't happen by its own. Okay, so we have of course photosynthesis, which is very close to what we're trying to do in nature. So I'm talking about some biological systems, enzymes, acid base, what have you. You take carbon dioxide plus water plus sunlight, catalytic cycle to make sugar and oxygen. This is the way most plants work. Plants are very good at this, they're just a little bit slow. Okay, and this is a, a multiple step catalytic cycle. We have the Krebs cycle where we take carbohydrates plus oxygen and through a bunch of steps catalyzed by enzymes, we make CO2 and energy. I'm not gonna go through every one of these lists. DNA replication, of course, converting glucose into ethanol. That's a catalytic reaction fermentation. And, and I think that's been a fairly influential reaction in the history of humans. Um, making beer, of course. A, a, a more, uh, well, a, a, an interesting one is the discovery of how to create penicillin on an industrial scale. The discovery of how to scale up the fermentation process is one of the events that resulted in the current population explosion because it allowed us to produce academic uh, academics. We do that too. Um, it, it allows us to produce antibiotics on a large scale. And I believe in World War II, the ability to produce penicillin in a large scale because of the fermentation process that was developed, uh, which is catalysis with a biological catalyst, uh, was a huge advantage for the Allies in World War II. They had a better antibiotic. Okay, so now we're getting into the uh, uh, catalytic reactions, the big catalytic reactions that have affected humankind the most. This is why I said in my title, I think it's more important than the wheel. Okay. Uh, one that you might not have heard about, but if anybody has a phone, I can guarantee you everybody who's using Zoom to watch this meeting has benefited from this reaction. When they make photoresists in computer chips, they use this reaction probably at least eight times when for every computer chip that's made. So the stuff that we're using right now, the uh, fancy new iPhone that's coming out Friday, it all uses this reaction. It's probably one of the most influential reactions that most people haven't heard of. But the fundamental point is this, you have a plate that's covered with a polymer and you want to use light to etch patterns into the polymer. So then when you etch away the metal and the polymer remains where it hasn't been etched by the light, you can make patterns for logic chips. And of course, as everybody knows, we want these um, features to be as small as possible. We want to manufacture them as quickly as possible and without any errors. Wilson and Frische, I'm certain I mispronounced his name, in an IBM patent, I think it came out in 1975, they found a way to do this. So you might say, hey, I wanna make a smaller pattern. So why don't I just use a shorter wavelength of light? The problem with short wavelengths of light, and they wanna make this smaller and smaller and look at other alternatives now, is you're getting into very high energy light, you're getting into ultraviolet light. And so that is so energetic, it burns everything. So if you want to use high intensity ultraviolet light, you wind up with very large crude patterns. What Wilson and Frische invented is this system where you take this sulfur compound, I'm not going to go into the details, I promise, but you take this sulfur compound, you hit it with the short wavelengths of light, and it makes a small amount of acid through a bunch of steps. So what's happening is you're using light to generate a catalytic amount of acid. These are the polymers that they use. These are not water soluble at all, but acid will attack this group to generate this, that, and I think it's here, I'm not sure it's blocked off, another equivalent of acid. So it catalytically breaks the end groups of the polymer only where the really weak intensity light hit. But because it's weak intensity, it doesn't burn anything else, but it generated this catalyst and the catalyst turns over this reaction over and over and over again. It's regenerated. And so you have a catalytic cycle 
amplifying a light event. And like I said, this is probably one of the most important reactions you may not have heard about because you could not have logic shifts without this catalytic reaction. You couldn't have the internet, you couldn't have phones. I guess you couldn't have cryptocurrency either. So as, as everything with science and applied stuff, it's a double-edged sword. Okay, let's carry on. Another one that you may not have heard of, but it is among the most important reactions on the planet. It's also catalysis. Again, it's all catalysis because catalytic reactions are so efficient. In fact, they're probably too efficient, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you take species with carbon double bonds. You get these from refining natural gas and other compounds. In fact, Nova Chemicals in Alberta is one of the larger uh, polymer producers on the planet. You take these double bonds, react them with catalyst, and you join them up on the head and the tail, and you make these long molecules called polymers. This, this is a ziegler natta polymerization, and this number is old, but literally hundreds of millions of metric tons are made by this kind of catalytic conversion of carbon-carbon double bonds into long chain molecules. And of course, plastics, which is what I'm talking about making here, are incredibly useful, but we are really efficient at making plastics. We're not very efficient in recycling them. And so we've got, this is just one kind of plastics. I just wanna make sure that people understand there are the kinds of plastics, but um, this catalytic production of these plastics, polypropylene and that sort of thing is a major contributor to uh, some of the pollutions in the oceans. Okay, so what we really need is a catalytic way to get this to go backwards with sunlight, to kind of catalytically regenerate these species using sunlight as a cheap energy source. So we don't just dump it in the ocean. We really have to stop dumping plastic in the oceans. Stop dumping plastic in the ocean, please. Okay, let's carry on. Looks like... Uh, my system. Oh, there we go. So let's carry on to another big, big reaction. It's called steam reforming natural gas. You may have heard about blue hydrogen. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. But basically, again, I know it's chemistry, but I'm going to keep it uh, very accessible, I hope. Uh, you take natural gas, which is CH4. It's a greenhouse gas, by the way and the leaking of natural gas is a problem for the environment because it is a powerful green, greenhouse gas. We'll talk about that soon. You take natural gas, you react it with hot water, steam, over a catalyst, you have to heat it. You make carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And the hydrogen is what we want. The carbon dioxide is what we don't want and that presently is largely just vented into the atmosphere. So the industrial need for hydrogen is producing enormous amounts of carbon dioxide, and it's something we absolutely have to tackle. Um, the situation about natural gas steam reforming is it's incredibly uh, cost effective. You can do this on huge scales, and methane is very accessible and inexpensive, but it is a greenhouse gas. I have to, I want to make that point, so have to do about it, but we can get methane readily from fracking. Okay, so chances are, unfortunately, unless we can shut this down, I don't know uh, about those things, um, but I suspect we're going to be steam reforming for a long time. A little bit about the process because it is um, the way that hydrogen is made on the planet. The first thing you do is you purify it, you remove the sulfur. So if you have say a sour gas well, they're talking about the sulfur molecules that are in there. It is a double step process or a several step process. There's one reaction and then another reaction. These are all done under catalysts. Okay, they all need energy to proceed. And then you do it again. So several catalytic steps, you remove the CO2 and you get the hydrogen, which is what people want. 
presently, most of this CO2 is being vented into the atmosphere, but I'm gonna tell you shortly about a way in which folks are trying to prevent venting this CO2. But when you see hydrogen, when you see hydrocarbons being upgraded, when you see the Haber process to make fertilizer, which I'll talk about in a second, it's all coming from steam reform. Most of it is. So this is a reaction that we have to um, make clean. It would be lovely to eliminate it, uh, but this is a key reaction that the world is looking at now. So steam reforming, multi-step process, so you don't do it in your back, you don't do it in the back of your car, right? Mainly on site, requires energy. The hydrogen is used everywhere. I'll talk about that. And people, one approach that people are, are uh, taking towards this is to try to capture the CO2 that is made by the catalytic steam reforming. And Air Products just outside of Edmonton has a pretty big blue hydrogen facility. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Okay, so first, what do you do with the CO2? Well, it might be best if we don't make it in the first place, but while we are still doing that, we have to do something with it. Uh, it would be better if we don't make it in the first place. Don't misunderstand me. Right? So what people are looking at is ways to sequester it. Now, again, I'm not going to rank these methods. What I wanted to do today was just inform you about the methods. All of them have faults. Some of them have strengths. That's a topic of a different presentation, which I have no problem giving. But today, I just want to give you the nuts and bolts about what's going on. And uh, so, so you are informed about these things, okay, which I think is pretty important. So the idea is you have a steam reformer. Okay, it's near water. You need water for steam reforming. And can you, the question is, and what people are trying to do is, can you pipe this CO2 and store it underground in some way. And you can imagine the questions that come up with that. So you might be able to put it in empty mines. You might be able to put it in very deep aquifers. You might be able to put it in coal bed methane to push out some of that methane. You might be able to store it in depleted oil and gas wells, or you can push it down oil wells that are operating and you push down the CO2 to push out more oil. Okay. And again, I'm not ranking these processes today. I'm just informing you about the thought processes behind them and what people are looking at. So blue hydrogen, what is it? So basically the whole idea behind it is you make the hydrogen with steam reforming and you sequester the CO2. The hydrogen isn't green, but it's blue, okay? And so there is actually a huge facility doing this just outside of Edmonton. So Air Products is, is doing this. You can read about it at their website, which I accessed a couple days ago. Hydrogen is produced by steam reforming, as we've seen, natural gas. All of the energy requirements to do the steam reforming is made on site from hydrogen and 95% of the CO2 is captured for sequestration. Again, this is information from their website. Uh, the CO2 that they're making is piped through a 240 kilometer pipeline from Edmonton to Clive, Alberta, or the area around there. It's called the Carbon Trunk Line. You can read about it on their website. And what's happening is the CO2 is being pumped from Northern Edmonton down to Clive, and it's being pushed down into depleted oil wells and gas wells there. I think they're trying to push out some uh, natural gas that they can still access down there, but the idea is eventually they will store, they are storing CO2 down there. So here's a picture of the webs of the pipeline. Okay, I, I bet you didn't know this is going on right in our backyard but it certainly is, okay? And so it is prepared just north of Edmonton. There is a 240 kilometer pipeline and they're pumping it into depleted wells down in Clive, okay? So again, I'm not going to rank these. I'm just teaching how they operate today, but I will say there are important questions to ask of any alternate energy uh, process. In this case, 
a good question to ask is how much methane is lost to leaks. Okay, the natural gas infrastructure can be pretty leaky. Uh, there are estimates out there that range about how much natural gas is leaking when you go from the well to the burner, okay? And methane is a strong greenhouse gas. So it is a reasonable question to ask how much uh, climate change, global warming gas and greenhouse gases are being emitted through fugitive leaks. How much is the total carbon dioxide released versus stored? Are there pumps running the pipeline? Uh, are they working on natural gas? So what's the total balance? And again, these are fair questions to ask, right? Is the storage of CO2 under these wells uh, permanent? What do we know about that? And what is the total greenhouse gas impact versus conventional processes? Or, you know, should we also, yes, should we also be looking at solar cells and stuff like that? And the answer to the, the last one is we should always be looking at solar cells and renewables as well. But I'm presenting the, the blue hydrogen system that we have here and that other people are developing around the world as one to give you an idea of how catalysis plays a role and to, again, to inform you about what's going on and the kind of questions that should be asked of these systems. So I wanna go a little bit into what we use the hydrogen for, going back now into catalytic reactions that uh, you might not have known about, but we all use every day, okay? And a big one is the Haber-Bosch-Mittach process. And basically what you're taking is hydrogen. We're getting it from steam reforming. People are using blue hydrogen now for it. You react it with nitrogen that you isolate from air. You do it over an iron-based catalyst. So it's a really inexpensive, abundant catalyst. And you make ammonia, NH3, which is turned into fertilizer. Uh, Haber invented it. Bosch uh, Mark uh, developed it and Mitosh find out, found out how to get it to work with iron. So I like to put his name on there. This reaction is probably the second or third reaction we've seen today that was responsible for the population explosion that happened last century and is still going on. The NH3 is used in fertilizer, 500 million tons per year at least is produced over the planet. I think it's fair to say that 30 to 50% of the world's population is sustained by it. It is at least feeding that many people with this process, okay. 50% of the protein in your body and mine come from nitrogen in the air that came from the Haber process that was used to make the fertilizer, to fertilize the fields, to make the plants that we grow. So again, it's one of the major factors in the population explosion. It's catalysis. It's interesting, it was invented during World War I as a way to get around gunpowder restrictions from ugly history come big things. Uh, and again, major factor, the other one is penicillin mass production, antibiotics in the population explosion last century, and it's still going on. This process consumes an enormous amount of methane in steam reforming, probably three to 5% of the entire amount of methane being used in the world is going into the Haber process. So you can see why folks are looking at alternatives, perhaps solar powered, making the hydrogen from water, blue hydrogen, these sorts of things are being looked at, right? These numbers are a bit low, but it's probably closer to 3% of the global energy production of the planet. So we really have to find a way to make the Haber process cleaner. Uh, not going to go into this too much. That's a bit of chemistry there. We'll let it go. Uh, they separate the ammonia by condensing it out and they can reuse the hydrogen and nitrogen, which is nice to get high conversions. Nutrien is a major fertilizer producer and they are operating in Alberta. And I believe they are hooked up into the blue hydrogen pipeline as well. So a lot of this stuff is going on in our backyards. Where else is hydrogen used? It's used in the Haber process. Of course, it's used to sweeten up fuels. I'm not gonna go through these reactions, but basically we are using it to make gasoline easier to burn. We are removing sulfur. We are removing nitrogen. 
I would say that all of the fuel that's being burnt in the planet right now went over a catalyst at some stage. So again, catalysis is so efficient that it's producing all the fuel that we need, but it's also producing carbon dioxide and causing climate change. So again, it's definitely a double-edged sword. Uh, you know what, Valerie, I think I wanna take a break here and answer questions. We're a little bit close to 30 minutes into it, but we're getting into the energy stuff, which is kind of the second part. So if folks yeah. wanted to ask me any questions at this point, I'm happy to do so. Sounds good. We will definitely jump into some questions. Uh, if you have questions for everyone who hasn't yet, you can pop them in the chat. Uh, to the whole group, to myself, to Cassie, and we will ask them for you. Uh, we have been sent some questions. So uh, the first one is early on, uh, I think it was your second graph, uh, this person submitted this question. Uh, it says that even though a catalyst is regenerated at the end of the reaction, does it re degrade over time at all? Is there situations where your catalysts do break down or is it full recycling? That is an excellent question. When you make a catalyst for the first time, you want it to last forever. Tragically, they do not. And so these 2 million turnovers, these massive recycling things are success stories. Usually you're lucky if you get 100 molecules of reactant going into the product before the catalyst dies. It, it's quite tragic and hard work. My students can tell you about this. Um, really, what you want out of a catalyst is good rate, long lifetime and recyclability as well. And it is really hard to get that to work well. We're, we're good with some reactions and other reactions we're not very good at it at all. And that's the classic research problem in catalysis. Excellent, thank you for that great question to our audience. Uh, the next question we had is similar, uh, kind of in the same vein. How green is the process of making catalysts? Does it often require or produce environmentally dangerous chemicals or waste materials? You know, it really depends on the catalyst. Some of them, and you know, the ones that are used in industry and the pharmaceutical industry and stuff like that, the requirements are very strict. And so you have to make them with green processes. In fact, one of the big things that we're working on right now is if we are going to make catalysts to solve the energy crisis to combat climate change, we can't use expensive catalysts that are difficult to make and don't last. We have to restrict ourselves to making catalysts as quickly as possible. You know, academics, we love coming up with a very difficult synthesis where you must avoid air, or you must keep it at minus 30 degrees and you do five steps on a line that everything is perfect. You, you can't do that and solve the energy crisis. You have to have stuff that's easy to make, not a lot of steps, solvents you can recycle and that last a long time. It's a very hard problem, but it's something we have to do. Absolutely. This leads really well into the next question we had is, how do you go about the process of finding a new catalyst for something that you're interested in optimizing? What does that process look like? You might be addressing that coming up, but I'll throw it out there now. Sure, I'll, throw, I'll, I'll answer that one and, and maybe we'll go on with the rest of the talk and we can answer some more at the end. So how do you find a catalyst? This is one of the biggest challenges in catalysis right now we've got to find new catalysts we've got to find something that'll turn co2 into something environmentally benign or make energy without co2 at all and so you you first of all you pick the reaction you want to do and then you say okay what can i make this catalyst out of i can't make it out of diamonds or uranium um or, or gold Probably not, although there are cases where you can for fine specialty chemicals. And then you say, okay, what do people know about this reaction? And you try to come up with your best ideas of what a catalyst needs to work for a reaction. And then you design a way to build a new catalyst with those components. And then you make it and it doesn't work. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't work. So then you look at the failure, you look at the 
the brown goo in the flask and you come up with another idea and you try it, right? And so that's the kind of intuitive try it and see approach. There are other people who are trying to come up with systems and they are that try 96 things at once. So you've got rapid screening where you've got 96 little reactors and a robot squirting in different chemicals into each well to build 96 reactions. They do them all at once. They measure how much they get. Ah, that's the one that worked and then they optimize that. Okay, so there's the other way to do it. The final way to do it is try to use artificial intelligence and machine learning. I've got a colleague, Professor Marr, who does this, and he's part of the future energy systems. And what you do is, is, is you teach the, the, the algorithm, you teach the software, uh, you give it all the information. So everybody has tried phosphorus, everybody has tried iron, this, that. You give it all the results. And the machine kind of looks at it all at once and finds trends. The machine doesn't care about chemistry. It just looks for trends in the parameter and says, hey, try that. It's not biased. It's something you probably would never have thought of. And then you quickly come up with a way to try that or 96 combinations of it, find the best, put it back in the machine and iterate it that way. Finding catalysts is hard. It takes a lot of time. And uh, we have no time, really, if we want to address the energy crisis and what's going on. And so um, a lot of people are trying to come up, up with ways to automate it, to do it as quickly as possible. And uh, just be lucky at the end and find the one that works. Well, there's always a little bit of luck in science. So much technique uh, and trial and error, but just a little bit of luck underneath it all. Uh, my students, my students can tell you that it, uh, although Mike got really lucky, okay, Mike, when he comes on, his first thing worked, okay, <laughs> all of the senior students were looking at this undergraduate who joined us, and the first thing worked, and you know what, so yeah, it is luck, absolutely, it's skill, I'm not taking anything from Mike, but you know, there's so many times that we think, oh, we know that this is going to work, and you try it, and it doesn't, but you know, that's science, you just keep working at it. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to hear what Mike found. We did have one last quick question and then we'll go right back sure. into your talk. Uh, so the last question was, can you condense carbon dioxide? Absolutely. And that's what they do to get rid of it from the hydrogen. So when you do the steam reformer, you get a mixture of hydrogen and carbon dioxide. The way they take out the carbon dioxide is they condense it and trap it that way. The question is, what do you do with it afterwards? How much energy does it take to condense it? And how much energy does it take to pump it down the ground, right? So that's a very good idea. And it is the one they are using, in fact. And of course, the question is, does this really add up to be useful? So many more questions. I feel like we could be here for days, but I'm going to pass it back over to you now. Uh, and we will ask some more questions at the end. Thank you so much. Well, I'm happy to pause a bit. Let me just have a little more orange juice and it is just orange juice that I'm drinking. Uh, it's funny, we other... kind of have a background. We couldn't actually see it until it was in front of you. So you were just holding nothingness in the air. <laughs> well, you know, there it is. This background, by the way, in case anybody's interested in our little break, this is the Veil Nebula. It's in the Cygnus constellation. And I took this picture from my backyard. So a little bit of a hobby there. So let's carry on. Let's talk about what we're going to, so the hydrogen economy, right? We now know how it's made. We now know that it has to be done in a cleaner way. And we now know one approach, blue hydrogen to do that. I'm going to talk, and we've also seen some of the uses of hydrogen, the Haber process, upgrading fuels. I'm not going to talk a little bit about fuel cells. How can we convert the hydrogen into electricity? Okay. And a fuel cell is a battery, but instead of carrying around the chemicals in it, you feed it fresh chemicals all the time. And I would say one of the big advantages of fuel cells is the other chemical they use is oxygen that it gets from air. I mean, they might compress it and stuff like that, but so it doesn't have to carry half the chemicals with it. So what happens is hydrogen reacts at one electrode, it's converted into protons, that's acid that we saw later, earlier, and electrons, the electrons go through the external wire, that makes electricity. And on this side, the oxygen reacts with electrons and protons to make water. So the overall reaction is hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas giving you water plus electricity. It's a pretty efficient system. 
technically it's a clean system, but as I said before, right now, all of the hydrogen, most of it, 99% of it in the world comes from steam reforming. So most of the hydrogen that's being used in the world right now makes carbon dioxide as well by steam reforming. So it's not clean. Okay, we have to clean it up. Now, if you're wondering, so fuel cells are pretty efficient. They have their place. They are compared to lithium ion batteries. Often I find they, they should be used in different places. But again, I'm not gonna talk about that. That's a subject of many other talks with people who know more about it and are very passionate about it as well. But looking at it just now, you might say, hey, can't we do this backwards? Can't we put energy, electricity into one of these, take water, and make hydrogen that way. And absolutely, the reverse of a fuel cell is called electrolysis. And that is how you can make clean hydrogen. You take water, you take a reverse fuel cell called an electrolyzer, you power it with a solar cell, you power it with a windmill, a dam, what have you, renewable energy source, and you make hydrogen that way. And that is certainly an approach that a lot of people are looking at as an alternative to steam reforming. Getting back to catalysis, you need a catalyst at both of these electrodes. Um, the Gemini space capsules were powered by fuel cells. The Apollo missions were powered by fuel cells. In fact, one of the fuel cells of the oxygen tank in Apollo 13 may have caused the trouble there. Certainly all their power dropped when they lost the oxygen in the Apollo 13 explosion because they lost the oxygen that was powering the fuel cells. So they had to switch to battery and this sort of thing. Okay, if you watch that Tom Hanks movie and they say fuel cell voltage is dropping, it's because they had fuel cells in there that were working on the oxygen that came from the tank. When the tank blew, they couldn't power the fuel cells anymore. And they went down. The space shuttles were powered by fuel cells. Um, I don't think the current fleet of spacecraft are. Okay. but. Uh, you can certainly reverse a fuel cell and do electrolysis, put electricity into water to make hydrogen and oxygen. And personally, I believe that's how we're going to make hydrogen at large scales in the future. But we'll see how that goes. There are problems with uh, challenges with all this chemistry. So advantages, high efficiencies. The only product from the fuel cell is water. We burn fuel in uh, internal combustion engine, you have nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide particulates. They're quiet, they have no moving parts. But um, of course, the fuel of choice for fuel cells right now would be really good if we get them to work on methane, but that's hard to do. But um, the, the fuel of, of choice for most fuel cells is hydrogen. And as we know, there are hard questions to ask about hydrogen how is it made? Um, another component we haven't gone into very much is you have to condense hydrogen related to someone's question about CO2 to liquefy it in order to store it with a high amount of energy density. It takes energy to run the pumps to condense that hydrogen, to compress it, to have high pressure hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen leaks uh, through steel and, and these sorts of things. It's, it's not that straightforward a process yet. And so there are big questions about the hydrogen economy as well. And safety, of course, is a big deal. If you want to use it in a car, you know, um, you're, you're looking at a high pressure gas tank to store that hydrogen and filling it up and stuff like that. And there are questions to be looked at there. Again, I'm not ranking these things. I'm just teaching folks what the um, processes are behind them and how catalysis plays a role. So let's talk about climate change, right? Um, it's real. We can't escape it. And we are really bad at it. Well, we are really good at climate change, but we are really bad at fixing it. And really, we have no choice. Okay, we have no choice. Our descendants are wondering why we're not fixing it right now. They're not happy with us. Okay, we've got to do something about this. And so what is it? Well, if you warm something up like the earth getting warmed up by the sun, it gives off heat by radiation. Okay, you can, you can hold your hands close to each other and you can feel the warmth. That's not convection, that's radiative heating. Everything that warms up gives off infrared radiation. If you ever use, and we, and we do this with a, 
excuse me, please. We, we do this with presentations to classrooms, which I hope we can get back to once uh, once the COVID situation is, is, is hopefully taken care of. Um, you, you, you get, you know, the infrared uh, cameras, that's reading the infrared radiation coming off of objects, right? The warmer it is, the more infrared radiation it gives off. There's no doubt about this, okay? So when the sunlight hits the surface of the earth, it warms up, earth cools down by giving off infrared radiation into space. Where the big problem comes in is if air absorbs some of that radi radiation before it escapes and traps it. Now it's supposed to do some of it, and water does it too, but the situation that we are absolutely in now, there's no doubt about it, okay? We've put a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, relative a lot, absorbs this radiation in windows where air is usually transparent. So this radiation, instead of going off into space, it's getting absorbed by CO2 molecules where the atmosphere normally wouldn't absorb it, at least with a lower amount of CO2, and it's heating up the atmosphere. It's, it's happening, there's no way around it. Another bad gas for this is actually natural gas and methane, and it absorbs infrared radiation in, we call them windows where air does not. So normally that air in that window or that wavelength range, if you wanna be a little more technical, would just let the infrared radiation escape into space. Methane is trapping it and warming up, right? And so the greenhouse, the efficiency of a greenhouse gas depends on how much is up there. It depends on what wavelength it absorbs in, how well it absorbs it, and also the lifetime of the gas. How long can we expect methane that's being released now? It's called fugitive methane from a pipeline. When it's released now or wherever it's released from, it stays up there for about 20 years and it's got a pretty good driving force because of how long it lasts and where it absorbs. And we can't escape this, we have to fix this, okay? And uh, that's the whole point of future energy systems to address this in a social way, in an experimental way. We've got a lot of people working on this because it's important and it's a hard problem. Okay, but climate change is real. Methane and CO2 are major contributors and we are putting too much of this out in the atmosphere. Okay. So this is the amount of methane measured at Mauna Lea uh, Observatory in Hawaii. It's, it's an isolated place, so it's a pretty good measure of how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. This was accessed, uh, when was it accessed? A little while ago, back in October, uh, October 18, 2022. It's, it's still going up. Okay, there's seasonal variations, but it is going up. And a couple years ago, uh, a UN panel on climate change said, look, even if we, uh, we have to stop it now to limit global warming, the average temperature warming up by one and a half degrees, that study is probably underscoring it, okay? If we stopped all emissions now, the temperature probably is gonna go up two and a half degrees or so. There are folks who are experts on this, okay? So, and that is a huge increase in the average temperature. We're talking about a lot of flooding. We're talking about large dry areas and whatnot, right? So we've got to take care of this now, okay? And one of the things that, that is as a feature of this is the earth is a big system, okay? So there's a lag between how much CO2 and methane is in the atmosphere now and where the temperature should be, okay? It should be higher. And that's why it's gonna continue to rise for a while, even if we stopped all emissions now and started to somehow take it out of the atmosphere, okay? And then the reason there's this lag is because of several effects. One is the albedo effect. So ice reflects sunlight. Ice is whiter than ground. As ice melts, the ground gets exposed. It absorbs more light, melting more ice, exposing more ground, absorbing more light. So it's unfortunately a feedback loop, okay? The other thing that's happening is when the land and oceans warm, they release gases, okay? So there are CO2, ga uh, greenhouse gases, methane trapped in the permafrost. You can look this up. There are huge 
craters opening up in Siberia where the permafrost is starting to melt. And this is all methane that's been trapped in ice cages. And as the ice cage is melting, out it all comes, okay? And as gases dissolved in the oceans, as a liquid warms up, the solubility of gas decreases. So it's going to release more gases. So we, we've, we've got ourselves in a feedback loop and we've got to get out of it, okay? So if you want to see methane trapped in ice in our neighborhood, I am a frustrated photographer, so I do put this stuff up. I took this picture too. This is Abraham Lake. It's out near, I think it's Nordeg, Alberta, okay? It's an artificial lake. They flooded it to produce a hydroelectric dam and there's uh, old wood and biomatter that's slowly releasing methane. When it freezes over in the winter, you can go there, it's beautiful. The methane gets trapped in these ice bubbles and that's what they are here, okay? And when it melts, all of this stuff is released and the same thing is happening. If you ever get a chance, go to Abraham Lake, it's beautiful. So what are we trying to do in our lab to take care of this? Well, as we know, and now I'm using slides that I also use for junior high school, for public school. So if they look a little bit um, accessible, that's, that's okay, we'll get by it, it's, it's good. So what we do now is we take hydrocarbons, we burn them in air, we make energy that we need for electricity, transportation. Most of the electricity in Edmonton is burned, is, is coming from burning coal, okay? We get the energy and we make CO2 and water. So what we are trying to do is get that energy in other ways. So of course, solar and wind and renewable energy, these are great. Uh, the price of solar cells is dropping dramatically. It's taking everybody by surprise, but that's intermittent and it's spread out usually. And so you need to store it. Okay, you could use batteries. Okay, and, and people are, and they have a place. You could pump water uphill, that has a place. Solar fuels, which is what we're working on, they all have a role, okay? If you ask me what the solution is going to be, it's going to be a little less capitalism, less conserving, stop with the Bitcoin, okay? Um, the internet takes a lot of energy too, and uh, storing alternative energy. But we take, it's gonna take us a while to get there, and we don't have that much time, okay? So we're gonna learn from plants, okay? And in fact, we already are, okay? So plants, and again, okay, the kids love this, so one of my, <laughs> my postdocs do that. It's awesome, so I, I use it all the time. What plants do is they'll take sunlight and CO2 and water and turn it into fuel for plants. It's photosynthesis. We talked about it way back in, in one of the first slides. And in fact, all of the fossil fuels that we burn now are old plants, okay? So we already are kind of using solar energy. We're just using it in the worst possible way. So a lot of the oil reserves in Alberta, I believe, are ancient algae and, and, and phytoplankton that were photosynthesizing CO2 at the surface of ancient oceans and it's been compressed into oil. That is stored sunlight, but we should really leave it in the ground and come up with another way to do it, okay. But plants do this. They're not very fast, but they're pretty efficient, okay. Yeah, my lab is still getting beat by the plants, if you're wondering, but we're getting there. Okay, so our science project is, can we do this with an artificial leaf that's faster? And so the whole idea is, can we take CO2 and water and use an artificial leaf to make fuels, not necessarily for cars, but for heat? Yeah, for large scale stuff, I'll tell you about how we're gonna do that. And so the idea is, can we store um, CO2 from the atmosphere in fuels. And if we burn these fuels, you have no net increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. But even better, don't release the CO2. Just keep recycling it and use CO2 to store solar energy. And we think there are some applications where this is a good idea. For example, we wonder, and we want to figure out, can you take a conventional fossil fuel plant, capture all the CO2, don't let it escape. Use solar fuels chemistry to store the solar energy in fuels and then burn those in the plant. Again, not letting it escape. And the whole idea is using a conventional fossil fuel plant and CO2 and sunlight to power it. So we're converting it 
hopefully into a solar powered system. Um, other uses where I'm afraid we're probably gonna keep using hydrocarbons for a long time, long range flight. Um, if you wanna fly from uh, North America to Australia, in, in a jet or any kind of airplane, I, I don't see batteries getting us there. Okay, um, I don't see hydrogen getting us there easily. It's probably going to be some kind of solar fuel rocket, long range transport, long, large scale heating. I believe we're still going to need hydrocarbons for that, but I hope and we're working towards coming up with solar fuels that are completely recycled so we have no net impact on the environment. At least that's the plan. So how does it work? So Octavio, we're getting close to moving over to you in case you're wondering, and Mike afterwards. We're coming close to the end of my part of the presentation. So the whole idea on a molecular level is to have a light absorber. Okay, and this, we call it a dye. And someone asked earlier, how do you make catalysts? And if you make a catalyst, does that have environmental impact? How do you make it? You try to make it as easy as possible and you try to eliminate the environmental impact by again, making it as easy as possible. If you have a 10 step synthesis, you generate solvents, you generate waste, you generate an enormous amount of waste for the little bit of chemical that you make. So you have to make these easily out of earth abundant, readily available material with little waste. And what you get is something that absorbs light. I'm pretty sure one of my students put a happy face on there for, this, for the students in school, and that is cool. You absorb light, you use that light to put energy into the electrode, or you transfer energy to a catalyst. In this case, we're taking carbon dioxide and hydrogen that we made from another catalyst, I'll show you in a second, to make methane, perhaps alkanes, diesel fuel would be nice, and water. So the whole idea is you have to have an electrode to move around electrons. You need a dye molecule and you need a catalyst and sunlight and all of these things have to work together to turn the CO2 into the fuel that you want to use. The hydrogen comes from water. I'll show you that in a second. The CO2 we get from burning the fuel or maybe extract it from the atmosphere. This is one of our electrodes, by the way, in case you're wondering what they look like. It is uh, titanium dioxide with our molecules absorbed onto the surface. This is an older electrode that Octavio made. And where do you get the hydrogen? You have another light absorber, another electrode. This would be maybe on the other side of the cell. It's absorbing sunlight. Again, it's gotta be inexpensive and easy to make. It works with a catalyst that takes water. This is electrolysis, what you saw in the fuel cell earlier, it takes water, turns it into hydrogen and oxygen. So the whole process, we would have this side working with this side. This side would make the hydrogen that goes in here, we would capture the CO2 to make the methane or the fuel that we could use in a large scale power plant or perhaps in an airplane to fly long distances, which you can't do with battery stuff yet. We'll see how it goes. So that is the end of my part of the presentation. Octavio will talk about his work where he is making a catalyst system that absorbs light and turns CO2 into, in fact, he's making carbon monoxide, which is an intermediate, and he'll tell you a little bit about what he found. Mike, is he, he's, he's the undergraduate who joined us and discovered a really cool result right in the very first day. Sometimes it happens. Uh, instead of water, he's using a host molecule to make hydrogen, and he will tell you about that work. So like I said, this is the end of my part of the talk. We'll switch over to Octavio when he's done. We'll switch over to Mike, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, we'll let Octavio join us on screen and get your presentation going. Uh, just a heads up for, well, anyone in the city, there is a thunderstorm. Uh, I know some of you are being hit by it. Uh, so. If we lose anybody, we will do our best to get you all back. Uh, but if you do get lost, um, you can check out the talk after uh, on our YouTube channel. But fingers crossed we can make it through the rest before uh, 
the storm gets too bad. Uh, Octavio, you can take it away with your slides. Well, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I'm going to present my screen now. Okay. I hope you can see it now, right? We can see your slides. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to start. Um, hello, I am Octavio. I work with uh, Steve Bergens in his research uh, lab. And I'm going to present today my, um, my PhD research project. Uh, that is related to artificial photosynthesis. We've been, well, Dr. Uh, Bergens was talking a little bit of uh, artificial photosynthesis. So I'm just going to proceed. Okay, so um, my project has its grounds on a very, on a problem that has a very big scale. And I'm gonna be talking about climate change and global warming. I'm gonna start by talking about uh, fossil fuels. Uh, to meet our energy demands, we actually burn the fossil fuels. And I'm sorry, it's not going forward. You may need to click the, it's hard to see because it's white, but in the bottom left corner, there might be a very tiny arrow that you can click to. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Okay, so um, I will continue. So because of we burn these fossil fuels, we have, uh, that is the cause of massive emissions of the CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, going from coal, from oil, and then gas also, and the industry of cement that also, uh, it's part of the main contributors to these massive emissions of CO2, reaching up to 36,000 megatons of CO2 per year. And this, um, the problem is that with this, excess of CO2, we have this uh, accumulation of CO2, right, into the atmosphere. We've seen an increase from 1960 to 2019 of about four times of CO2 emissions. And that is a big problem. And the problem with that is that, uh, like uh, Dr. Bergens was saying, the CO2 absorbs energy from the sun and then re-emits it into the atmosphere, and then that's been causing some temperature increase in, around, the, around the world. And then um, we are uh, familiar with these uh, problems that have, have been occasioned for, for this temperature increase. So we know that we must stop this. We, we must think again, we must reimagine on how to um, meet our global energy demands. And therefore, uh, the renewable energy technologies uh, were developed, right? Um, despite of the fact that these technologies have been very successful, wind, uh, solar, geothermal, biofuels, or hydropower, we see some mismatch, some impairment, impairment of the supply and demand because of the day and night cycle, geographical location, because of the season, and also because um, currently, well, up to 2019, it was a very low production compared to the consump consumption of, uh, of our energy. It's only, uh, roughly speaking, it's 4% of the global energy consumption. And also another um, situation is that we cannot use this renewable energy for uh, the transportation industry, like the aviation. Um, so one of the favorites to meet our energy uh, global demands is the solar energy. And the reason for that, it's because it's virtually infinite, it's free, and it's worldwide distributed, right? But the problem is that we still need to store that energy, okay? And then, uh, and yet, we also have the other problem of the excess of the CO2 into the atmosphere, the, the, the existing CO2. So what we have to deal with now is carbon capture and then using that solar energy. So let's imagine for a second that we can collect the CO2 that is coming out from a power plant and then we can trap it and then convert it back into um, chemical feedstock that can be uh, converted again to fuels by the use of renewable energy. That'll be great because then we can create this CO2, um, this carbon zero network, uh, carbon zero economy. 
Um, so what do we propose? We propose to develop a um, device that can convert that CO2 into other useful chemicals like carbon monoxide or methanol, formic acid, and why not? Maybe even methane. And that is gonna be powered by the sunlight, ideally. But how exactly do we plan to do that? So if we look closer at, uh, to our device, this is um, how it would look like, look like. So we have a few parts here. For example, this is gonna be uh, the surface. Is it called a semiconductor? And on top of that semiconductor, we will have this ruthenium molecule, this ruthenium polypyridyl, which is the molecule responsible for absorbing the light. And then it's gonna be connected to this rhenium pyridine um, molecule that is responsible for the CO2 reduction. So because of the CO2 reduction requires electrons, uh, we apply a small voltage and then uh, with the use of uh, sunlight, those electrons are gonna be promoted from the ruthenium to the rhenium and then rhenium will do the job of reducing the CO2. Now, um, here is just a little bit of the process of the fabrication of these device, which is which are these small electrodes, or we also um, call them the artificial leap. So we start from the fabrication, we deposit the nano the nanoparticles on the electrodes, and then we graft these uh, organic anchors to the surface of the semiconductor, and then we attach here ruthenium complex to the surface and then finally the ruthenium. Throughout this whole process, we characterize all the um, intermediates just to make sure that we are getting what we think we are. And then um, here, I'm gonna show you this graph. It's, um, it's gonna be showing uh, the photo, sorry, the density, the current density over time. So we tested these electrodes, these artificial leaps so we applied the voltage that I was telling you. And then what we can see is that we obtain a background current, right? And then we switch the light on. And what we see is an increment in the current, which is indicative that this ruthenium molecule is absorbing the light. And then it shuttles the electrons from the ruthenium to the rhenium, to the catalyst, and then the catalyst is reducing the CO2. When we turn the light off, we see again that the current decreases. If we turn it on again, the current increases and so on and so forth. Um, the only problem with this, because uh, this is actually a proof that our system works, the only problem with this is that for this particular system, it only worked with a very high uh, intensity light. So what did we do next? So we tried the same system, a, sim a very similar experiment, but now instead of having the ruthenium, rhenium attached to the surface, we only have it in solution. And we uh, can confirm that the system works. Here we have a number. Uh, it's the third level number, which is, um, measure of how many molecules we can, of the product we can have per molecules of the uh, photocatalyst. And we found that um, it is converting the CO2 into carbon monoxide. However, the numbers are not great. Here, just for comparison, uh, in 2013, a group, uh, a research group from, Japan, from Tokyo, uh, they published that they could reach up to 3,000 turnover numbers, which is great. And then they are having a comparable system, right? Um, so what uh, can we conclude from the project that we, Dr. Bergens and I, we've been working on? It's that this project is complete. We did what we could. We explored the options. We put all the best ideas that we had. And the publication of these results, although they are not great, they are not the greatest, um, is in progress. And then also, thanks to the development of this technology, 
of this uh, photo system, we could apply the uh, knowledge uh, to develop another photocatalytic system, another um, artificial leaf. Now, instead of having these ruthenium rhenium um, molecules attached to the surface, we can now put organic dyes, which are, which are cheaper and then also easier to synthesize and then um, environmentally greener. And then also the catalyst, we are now using earth abundant materials to synthesize them to also make our system greener and greener. And up to this point, it has shown very good results. So we are excited also to be working on this uh, new project. And like Dr. Bergens was saying, um, Mike, and um, there was another undergrad student, Ellie, uh, they both were working on these new organic dyes with this uh, uh, new catalyst. So um, this is the end of my presentation. Um, from here, I will be glad to take any questions that you may have. And thanks for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're going to pause on the questions uh, until Mike's done, just to make sure that we can get uh, his presentation and then we'll jump back with questions for all of you if that works yeah yeah perfect all yeah. right okay, so i'm gonna pass for mike and then um thanks again thank you so much all right mike we'll get you on camera and uh hope that you are not having a thunderstorm where you are in ontario no we're all good it rained all day here but clear skies <laughs> there you go all right let's uh see if we can get the slides to work all right here we go all right, can you guys all see that? Yes, we can. Perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Mike Donahue, and as Dr. Bergen said earlier, I worked in his group as a traveling undergrad researcher for the summer. And I'm so excited to get to share with all of you some really cool chemistry from our summer project on using a cobalt photocatalyst to produce hydrogen. So as you saw by the title of my presentation, I used a photocatalyst or created a photocatalyst that could uh, help produce hydrogen. Now, you might be asking yourself, why has there seemingly been such a big craze for hydrogen in the past decade? And it's a fair question, but the most common response you're going to get is that we're looking for more green options to replace our current use of fossil fuels. And hydrogen is just one of those options. It not only offers solutions to power production, but it could also serve as a really effective means to store energy. Uh, we could exploit hydrogen as a fuel source in a fuel cell just like this one. Now, I know this diagram at first glance might make it look pretty complicated, but the fundamental working uh, principle of how a hydrogen fuel cell works is actually really simple. When you combine hydrogen with oxygen to produce water here, and a stream of electrons is actually produced across this membrane. And this is because in order to get hydrogen to react with oxygen in this way, you need to actually rip off electrons from it. And this membrane kind of absorbs those electrons. And then we can tap into that stream. And well, what is a stream of electrons but just electricity, right? And to be honest, before the summer, I really had no idea how fuel cells work or batteries in general. And I find it so cool now that I understand it. But at the most simple level, it's really just that we're exploiting a little reaction going on in there. And we're tapping into the electrons that are produced and we're siphoning it off. And now what sets a hydrogen fuel cell apart from a normal battery is that um, when you do this reaction, theoretically, there should be no waste products, right? All you're making is water. It also doesn't require those uh, toxic heavy metals that are present in other batteries to make their reactions work. Now, not even thinking about the kinds of climate issues that the widespread use of a clean energy source like hydrogen would uh, help solve, as Dr. Bergens has kind of already talked about, it also serves as a way to stabilize our global energy infrastructure. So right now, because the price and availability of fossil fuels are tied so closely to how we produce energy, the energy economy and infrastructure is extremely volatile. It seems that prices on gases change by the hour, and we keep hearing on the news that we are only running out of sources of oil faster and faster. For a second, I'd like us to imagine the kind of impact that hydrogen fuel cells would have on that section of our economy. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Having our energy production tied to a fuel source like this would mean that the price of fuel is no longer based on the availability of it. The main issue right now, and this is what our work tried, this summer tried to address, is that here on Earth, the hydrogen we have available is locked into either mainly water or other organic compounds. There hasn't yet been an environmentally friendly way created for us to access that hydrogen. 
trying to get gaseous hydrogen from water is actually really, really hard. It's not a process that nature readily allows us to do and requires a bunch of energy. And so that's where our work comes in. As a basic introduction of what we did, which I promise we'll get into deeper later, we made a catalyst that can use visible light, like from the sun, to produce hydrogen from water. Um, catalysts of this kind are called photocatalysts because they use photons as an energy source. Now I'd like to give a bit of background on my favorite area of chemistry, which is photochemistry. It's a pretty new field and we don't really know much about it. All photochemistry really is though, is in its name. It's a field focusing on finding a way to make chemicals by using light. Now, to me, when I first heard that, that sounded like some old timey alchemy or something like that. And like, how are we just making new compounds just from light? And it's a super basic de description that doesn't really do the field justice. The main principle of why photochemistry is useful though, is that many of the reactions we do in industry and the ones that power our daily lives are not favorable ones. And what I mean by favorable is that again, they are ones that nature really doesn't want it to let us do. And so it requires us to put energy into the system in order for anything to react. Most of these reactions don't work just by throwing some chemicals into a beaker and letting it do its thing. We need to feed it energy either in the form of heat or electricity, and most of the time they will require a massive amount of both. But some brilliant chemists discovered that some chemicals are really good at harvesting light and taking it in as an energy source. If we take dyes for an example, they are the compounds that give our clothes color. But what is color and how is it that light is the sort of energy source for color? Well, both of those questions would really require a week of lectures to dig into, but to give you some intuition for it, when a chemical like a dye get hit, gets hit with light, the electrons in the chemical get excited because all light really is, is energy. And so they get excited by this light and well, they can't just hold on to it because it's in a pretty unstable form. And the process of these electrons relaxing back down from being excited actually emits photons. And these photons are going to give off a specific color based on the type of dye. So I really like this picture down here. It helps illustrate in the simplest possible way how color works. If we take the blue dye on the top for an example, we can see that it's primarily absorbing orange light and outputting blue light. And this is because um, this uh, interaction kind of has a complementary color wheel association. Um, but back to photochemistry though, those same brilliant chemists thought that, well, what if the electrons in the dye just never relaxed? Could we take those excited electrons and move them, uh, have them power things, uh, just get them to be useful? And that's really where photochemistry took off. We started finding ways to use dyes to actually flow electrons into these reactions. And again, what is the flow of electrons, but just electricity? And this is the basis of how our photocatalyst works. We found a dye that is really good at absorbing light in the visible portion of the spectrum, which is really important because most chemicals can be excited by tons of different kinds of light, whether it be ultraviolet or infrared, but those forms of light really aren't accessible to us here on earth. We have a great big visible light producer just uh, not too far away from us in our solar neighborhood. But yeah, so our dye can accept visible light and feed electrons into this reaction on the right here. Now, this is just one half of the reaction of water splitting, where we are able to obtain uh, pure hydrogen gas from water. And you can see that it, it's a two electron process. You need to have electrons present in order to make hydrogen. Now, it's not only a dye that's needed because as I said earlier, all it's really doing is feeding electrons in, but we also need another chemical to make this reaction go, which is a catalyst. Now, the most exciting thing about our dye catalyst combination is that it's actually almost entirely organic, save for a singular cobalt atom. And this is actually a pretty big deal because until recent years, we really didn't have a way to do this without having compounds that are chock full of really expensive, rare, and toxic metals. So here on the right is our catalyst. And uh, I know it looks like a big jumble of atoms and lines. And at first, I really didn't know what I was looking at. Uh, when I first saw it, but here on the bottom is this dye, and uh, right now we just kind of have a boring acronym for it, and we're definitely open to naming suggestions, but yeah, right now we call it 4ZZIPN, and here's where it's actually connected to our cobalt catalyst through this little nitrogen cycle. Now, this cobalt uh, molecule at the top with the nitrogens around it is actually not new. It's uh, been used to do stuff like this before, but right here, in this little nitrogen cycle is actually where those excited electrons from the dye get pumped into the catalyst and to, to perform that reaction I showed you on the last slide that needed two electrons. And as you can see in this little gift down here, 
uh, the dye makes our catalyst give off a beautiful bright yellow color. Now, since it's outputting yellow color, that tells us that it's primarily absorbing blue light. And so we thought to use these, set up a little reactor and use using these cheap little blue LED lights. Um, and we the main reason we did that was just because we thought that, well, if it's primarily absorbing blue light, maybe use, only using blue light will make it uh, produce hydrogen better. But do remember that this catalyst also works when using white light, which is what the sun gives off. So here in the second bullet point is what we, the main piece of data that we were really after this summer. As you can see, we got a turnover number of 906, 926. And a turnover number is just how many times can the catalyst be recycled to produce an equivalent amount of hydrogen. So this means that our catalyst was able to recycle itself over 900 times when it was making hydrogen. And when we use just a singular milligram of it, this turnover number corresponds amazingly to about 15 milliliters of hydrogen being produced. Now that number might sound a bit small, but it's actually kind of insane to think that that tiny amount of catalyst can produce that much gas. And just imagine if we scaled it up. So unfortunately, because of COVID, that's all I was really able to get done this summer. Um, we are so, so happy that this photo catalyst is doing so well, but if anything, it was more of a proof of concept. Unfortunately, the technology really isn't there for a catalyst like ours to be put into widespread use yet. But on the basis of it working so amazingly well, we are encouraged to keep exploring photochemistry and photocatalysis as a solution to our energy crisis. While it might not be because of this specific catalyst, the end goal of this kind of research is to get hydrogen fuel cells to be a working, efficient, and viable option. Keep in mind, though, that this catalyst would not be going in the fuel cell. This is the step before, where we create hydrogen to then use in the fuel cell. So we want to get this catalyst on, actually onto the surface of an electrode, as Dr. Bergens was talking about, so that we can be splitting only pure water. Because when we're in solution, like what uh, my tests were this summer, we had to have other chemicals present in order to get the catalyst to recycle itself. But when you get it onto the surface of an electrode, it completes the circuit, and it's able to just continuously recycle itself so that you're only splitting pure water. Also, the dye that we use is actually really unique. It's really new, and we still don't know much about it. But it seems to be absorbing light at a really efficient rate, uh, possibly even at unprecedented levels. And we really want to see what might be done with this super cool and fully organic dye. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to give this talk. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope you all find this kind of chemistry as exciting as I do. And I would love to answer any questions that you guys might have. Just realized I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike, Octavio, and Steve. I love hearing about all of your passion for this work, and it's such an interesting area. Uh, also, thank you for the amazing discussion happening in the chat. Uh, if you've got some questions, please pop them in there. Uh, if you do need to leave, we totally understand. Uh, just before we get into the Q&A, I am going to share some links for upcoming events that we are hosting uh, as part of Energy Week. So we have one more symposium session tomorrow. Uh, we have our carbon capture lecture, so really linked to what we were chatting about, our book launch for Future Energy Systems new book, and our poster event. Uh, you can also learn more about uh, Dr. Bergen's lab and research and future energy systems. Uh, Cassidy will be sharing all of this in a survey link uh, and an email, so you will get all this. So let's dig right into the questions. Uh, there was an, a, an extended question to that discussion you were having, Octavio, in the chat. Uh, the light source looked like a concentrated UV source. Is that the case? Or it might be related to Mike's work. Yeah, I think that might have been related to mine. And uh, it was not UV. It was just a uh, blue LED. Uh, so it's just a, a blue light. Perfect. Thank but, you for that clarification. I'll just point out it cost 18 bucks from Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love when it's, when it's affordable science right there, right? I mean, all of my research was using human waste, so it was free. So I'm a big fan <laughs> of, you know, cheap and free we, options. I, we can. I, I will also add that we do do some work in the parking lot. We have some catalysts for other reactions that we actually just go in the parking lot and do. And we have some really expensive light sources to simulate the sun. 
<laughs> some as well. So yep. We're all over the, shall we say, spectrum of solar pricing. There you go. Amazing. Uh, so the first question that we have, and I'd love to get all of your perspectives on it, is a lot of the conversation right now around carbon dioxide centers on that carbon capture and storage idea. Yours seems to be focusing on the idea of conversion. Is there room for both or are we going to have competition that favors one or the other? How linked can these be? Uh, so Steve, if you want to start and then we'll pass it to Mike and Octavio to, to see if they've got any additional perspectives. Well, what I can say is there is lots of room for different approaches now. I, I think if you see where everyone is, we're all kind of pre-competitive. Um, I'm not sure anybody knows what the final system's going to look at. The main thing right now is to try new ideas and to get as many people working on it as possible. Um, carbon capture is uh, a, a, a technology with, with some pretty big questions. Will the CO2 ever be released? What is the CO2 doing down there? What is the capacity? How much energy does it take to run those pipelines? It, it's, there's questions about all of these things, right? For our work, where are you gonna get the CO2? Can we use carbon capture? Can you isolate it? We, we think you can isolate it from a power plant and stuff like that, but I, 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 I've seen a lot of these kind of discussions break down into our systems better than yours. And, and we're all kind of too early to start making those decisions, to be honest with you. Absolutely. Let's take all the options we possibly have available and see what we can do with them. Octavio, Mike, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I would just add that um, putting all of our eggs into one basket obviously didn't work in the past. That's what we did with fossil fuels. Um, there's, there's, there's room for many different uh, alternative energy options, and I don't think it's just going to be one of them that uh, brings us forward. It will Absolutely. be a system for sure. Yeah. No silver bullet. Yeah. Awesome. Octavio, anything to add to that? Um, uh, not really. I think that was a great answer from both. I also think that we have to uh, store that um, CO2. But ideally, I think it would be better if we can not only store it, but at the same time utilize it or converted, right? But uh, we don't know if, um, what the final system will be. Probably we may need to store it for some time and then use it when we need it or use it when the demand increases. Um, Ideally, yeah, probably it's, it's gonna be a, a multiple, um, multiple systems, not just one. Sorry, I just wanna add, ideally we won't make it in the first place really. Right. The thing about carbon storage is you're storing it because you're making it. We'd like to avoid making it at all, and that making it at all if possible. Absolutely. Sorry if you can hear thunder on my end. We're getting some big booms over here right now. Uh, so the next question we had from the audience was, for the carbon to fuel reactions, is the motivation to be able to take CO2 directly from the atmosphere or from the exhaust of a thermal plant or some other industrial source. Uh, Octavio, do you want to start with that question? Yeah, sure. I think um, ideally it's best if we do not let escape the CO2 into the atmosphere because then we have to put more energy into um, harvesting again that CO2 from the atmosphere. So the ideal solution is to take it directly from the exhaust of a power plant, for example. Then we take that gas, the CO2, and then we may uh, store it or dissolve it in uh, some solvent and then for future use. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Steve, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I think getting CO2, extracting it from the atmosphere is just not an easy process and it's pretty energy intensive. Um, I, I'm in the camp of let's not put it, let's not put it out there in the first place, if it's at all. I, I mean, with things like jets and stuff like that, uh, I, I don't think we can put, you know, a pipe on the exhaust of a, of a jet and capture the fuel. So we're going to still put some out there, but hopefully we can offset that in some way. Right. 
But I, yeah, I think ultimately the way to get CO2 out of the atmosphere is not put it up there in the first place. It's doing no harm in the ground. Let's try to leave it there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is kind of leaving the CO2, CO2 world behind. Would a similar technology uh, be possible for other greenhouse gases like uh, nitrous oxide, methane, or is the situation chemistry so entirely different that that is not uh, something uh, that you're considering? Uh, Steve, we'll start with you. Well, one of the things that we are looking at is like, for example, right now, a lot of methane is used to make the hydrogen for um, the hopper process to make fertilizer. I think it would be fantastic if we could get the hydrogen from the hopper process using water and sunlight and, and forgetting the whole carbon cycle, if it was at all possible, right? So that's certainly something that I, I think people should look at, right? Um, the thing about nitrous oxides and all these things is, again, the best way to keep them out of the air is not put them up there. And, and that's really what we have to look at capturing it and bringing it back after we've put it up there is okay, but let's stop putting it up there somehow. And I'm not saying I have the answers to that, right? Wonderful. Octavio, Mike, anything you want to add to that? Perfect for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next question, uh, Mike, we're going to start with you this time, but we'll go through the whole group, uh, is is your technology impacted by where you are in the world? Is it impacted uh, by the cold weather and the short daytimes of places in the Northern Hemisphere? Is it more successful uh, in warmer, sunnier locations? Does location matter? Uh, Mike, if you wanna start. Yeah, uh, definitely, because, um, well, so I'll say this, the, the nice thing about the cobalt catalyst that we made this summer is it's actually like surprisingly stable to a lot of different conditions, uh, whether it be cold or aerobic or less oxygen, whatever it be. Um, but definitely the amount of sunlight you have available would uh, be a challenge. Be, and that would have to be some sort of external solution where maybe we could find a way to amplify the sunlight onto the plants. And I, I can't really picture that being too hard. The catalyst here is really the bottleneck. It's not the amount of sunlight that you could access. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Octavio. Yeah, I agree with Mike. I think the main uh, limitation for our systems is the intensity of light. Because um, uh, if the day is uh, cloudy, we may not be able to get uh, enough um, power to, um, to power the system. Yeah. Thank you so much. Steve, we'll pass it to you for any final thoughts on that question. I would agree that without sun, we're in trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. And, but I, I think general, and, and yeah, cloudy days are a problem. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, I, I, I think um, this, in my mind, this amplifies the idea that not one solution is going to fit every part of the world. Right. I mean, around the equator, there's obviously a lot more sunlight, it's more direct, more hours of sunlight. Um, solar is a great option there. Further north areas with inclement weather, we're looking at wind and other options as well. It's, it's going to be a system that is adaptable to the needs and the climate. There's no escaping that. Probably why we call it a future energy system and not just a single technology. Precisely. Wonderful. So we have one question left. Uh, anyone in the audience, if you have a last question that you're burning to ask and you haven't had a chance to type it in the chat, please do so now. Uh, uh, and this is the one that we do have at the moment. Uh, and you have touched on this, all of you, a little bit. But how far is this process from being ready to use and commercialize? Are we going to see this in a year? in five years, in 20 years, in 50 years, what, what does our timeline look like? Uh, Octavio, we'll start with you and then go to Mike and then finish up with Steve. Yeah, um, I think, well, my system, my, my, the system that I presented to you, it might not be uh, at some point ready for, uh, to take it to the commercial state. We, we decided to create that project uh, as a demonstration and also to learn from that. But um, if we move to, 
towards the um, organic dyes and the uh, manganese complexes, um, the manganese catalysts, uh, we might be able to, uh, to have a system that works. In the timeline, I would say probably if we are successful, we will be looking at five to 10 years before we can reach to the state of uh, the commercial state. I am um, being optimistic. Yeah, it's doable, but uh, I think it requires, it requires a lot of time. Yeah, a lot of time, a lot of research to get yes. there. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, you're really new to the field. So with your, your kind of early on experience, what are your thoughts towards that? Yeah, so I'd say just about every single year, we see a new catalyst that is uh, breaking some record and whether it's turnover number or stability or, and I kind of view it as how our tech industry is being boomed. It's kind of an exponential increase into uh, like as little parts are discovered, new pieces of like giant pieces of tech are made. Um, so I would say with projects like Octavio and I's and the rest of the groups, it's really about finding those little pieces for then someone in the next five or 10 years. I would agree that five or 10 years, it might be a bit optimistic, but I'd say for both uh, hydrogen production and carbon dioxide reduction, that's realistic in my opinion. But um, it's really that the combination of all these pieces across the world, like there's, there's a bunch of other different groups across the world who are kind of trying to do the same thing as us. They're not exactly the same, but it's going to have, it's going to eventually get to a point where, well, let's take the part from that group and the part from that group. And then we're going to make a really efficient catalyst. And that's kind of how chemistry has worked in the past. But yeah, I would say I would hope five to 10 years. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Everything crossed. Uh, Steve. You've been working in this for quite a while. Where do you think we're going in timeline? Every time we get started, COVID shuts us down. But I could do it in two years <laughs> if I had the funding. If people want to talk to me about funding it, I can tell you how to do it. But I'm not going to say out loud. No, realistically, boy, I, every time you think you got it, it throws you a wrench, right? It, it's hard to predict. At the beginning of of every project they asked scientists to write down a very detailed timeline. What are you gonna be doing for the next two years? Break it down to the month. Why aren't you there yet? Why are you ahead? It, it's unpredictable. I've got a lot of ideas. I'm optimistic, but I think five years would be a minimum. We will keep our fingers crossed and we'll have to have you back in five years if uh, we're all still here and find out where we are in the solar well, we are open to more funding too. So if folks want to fund the research, let me know. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I want to thank Mike, Octavio, and Steve so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have all learned so much about solar fuels and we all made it through the thunderstorm. So yay, we're all still here. Huge round of applause. Uh, thank you for thank spending- Thank you so much, everybody. Thank yes. you. Thank you to our audience members. Thank you for spending the- the after, well, the evening now with us. Uh, we're so excited to have you. Cassidy will be sending an email with a bunch of links. Cassidy, would you like to say goodbye from the library? Yes, just thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing your evening with us, both those of you who were speaking and those of you who joined us to listen along. Um, yes, one last email from me slash EPL for this month, just to make sure you have all of those links so you don't have to remember to grab them. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone from Future Energy Systems. Uh, any last goodbyes from our speakers that you'd like to pass on to our audience? Uh, just uh, personally, I just want to say thanks so much for your time. And uh, Mike and Octavio, you both did amazing work and amazing talks. Mike, don't think research is going to go this well. You were very lucky. <laughs> you need a little more struggle, my friend. I've had every but person I hope, tell I me I hope that. you don't have it, but you know, don't get don't get too spoiled by your for your by your great early success. But we will cross our fingers that it's just like smooth sailing the whole way. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you everyone. Uh, and we'll see you hopefully at next month's talk.